we listening to? The End of the World? Is that how the world will end? I don't know. But we'll talk with the author of the book, This is the Way the World Ends, on this episode of the Growthbusters podcast. Call in, call in, call in, call in, call in, call in. Call the Growthbusters. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growthbusters podcast. Here we discuss our society's addiction to growth, and we do our best to chart a sustainable course for human civilization. Because we've got a planet to save. Well, I'm Dave Gardner, director of the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, and creative director here at the ad agency of record for Planet Earth. And I'm Erica Arias, co-growth buster and avid enthusiast for society's divorce from unsustainable growth. For cutting edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth, and what we can do about it, visit growthbusters.org. Well, before we get to how the world will end, as you know, I like to include a little bit of uh, listener feedback. And I'll tell you, Erica, I think we must have hit a little bit of a home run with our music program, the Overshoot playlist, top 10 environmental songs, because we got a lot of email and Facebook comments, et cetera, et cetera, from people about that, didn't we? Yeah, we sure did. I want to share a few of those. And I got an email from William Reese, who was the co-originator of Ecological Footprint Analysis. And we heard from him in that uh, Earth Overshoot Day special, the Overshoot special that, that was our last episode. Very, very smart guy. You know, he just wrote to me privately. And then I said, hey, I'd, Bill, I'd really like to share this with our audience. Is that okay? And he said, sure thing. So William Reese wrote, must say, I'm also impressed by the numbers of people who have never heard of Overshoot, let alone Overshoot Day. I'm not sure it's because of ignorance of available information, lack of information, or denial of information received. Another part of me wonders whether it makes any difference. In general, people don't seem to respond to data or information if it is hostile to their way of life, particularly if responding means extra effort or cost. Governments follow this general pattern. If one inserts the dates of the many climate agreements, accords over the past 40 years into a graph of global carbon emissions, for example, there is little evidence that said agreements have had an effect. Emissions continue to rise, 2% last year, and that's just carbon. Even where there are emissions reductions, there is evidence that this is as much the result of offshoring carbon-intensive industries. Much of China's bad rap comes from manufacturing for Europe and North America. The associated emissions should be subtracted from China's account and added to the importing country's records. Anyway, keep on plugging away. At least it greases the skids of public acceptance of new policies when and if they are ever forced upon us. Thanks for writing to us, Bill. Well, it means a lot to hear from somebody as smart as he is, because it was back in the 90s when he was developing ecological footprint, the whole concept of that. A very smart guy, but it always breaks my heart when uh, someone really articulates the how disappointed they are in the human race so far in doing something with the information that he helped present and that we have helped present. Yeah. Does that depress you a little bit, Erica? It really does. And you know, to kind of answer his question, I think he already knows the answer, but I'm in agreement with him. I think it is, a lot of it is due to both ignorance and denial of information received. In fact, on Earth Overshoot Day, I came across an article titled, Why Earth Overshoot Day and the Ecological Footprint are Pseudoscientific Nonsense by Mr. Michael Schallenberger. So in this article, Schallenberger basically claims to have helped debunk Earth Overshoot Day and the ecological footprint calculation in a paper for the peer-reviewed scientific journal PLOS Biology titled, Does the Shoe Fit? Real versus Imagined Footprints? And this was published six years ago. So as all good scientists do, I went and read the article after, and I'm going to go ahead and just read directly from the article, um, a concluding statement, which I think was kind of got me. I think uh, our listeners will have something to say. I think, Dave, you'll have something to say. Let me go ahead and read. It's, in conclusion, the ecological footprints, carbon footprint, as currently constructed, is an unreliable and impractical illustration of human demands on the biosphere in general and carbon emissions in particular. 
Hence, conclusions using ecological footprint to assert how many planets we are using or to comment on the sustainability of human populations, current or projected, is misplaced. Currently, anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases are a serious problem, but these are better estimated directly than by calculating a number of planets needed to offset emissions. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hate to give any oxygen to that. Yeah, it? I think we're both biased here, but just to kind of give him a little bit of credit, I wanted to share that. And I think it's important to say that ecological footprint calculator is really the closest thing we have to measuring what is left of the planet to provide for all of us. So it's in a step in the right direction. It's not perfect. And true. We recognize that the creators of Ecological Footprint recognize that, and they state it very openly. But it's also accessible to everybody with a computer. I mean, it's it's also intended to provide perspective for just how great the problem is. And unfortunately, like Bill tells us, like most scientists will tell us, people unfortunately do not respond to statistics and exact projections of the problems that we're facing. So I think this is a step in the right direction. And uh, I also wanted to add, like, I hope that the title of this article is just really editorialized because and not coming from Schallenberger himself, because calling ecological footprint pseudoscientific science is really not productive or descriptive in the slightest. And uh, I was a little hurt after reading this, (laughs) but I wanted to share it. Well, I have a couple of editorial comments about that. First of all, when the Global Footprint Network started doing ecological footprint accounting, they didn't start out with the goal of computing how many Earths we need to be sustainable at current levels of consumption. They ultimately kind of ended up with that as a communication technique, an illustration, a valuable illustration, because the average Jane, Dick, and Monica out there They don't read the data. They don't want to read the data. They don't necessarily understand what people write in the scientific journals. They need something that kind of summarizes it. And so the number of Earths needed technically to support, you know, a given lifestyle is, uh, I think it's a really valuable illustration. It doesn't surprise me that, that that's what they pick on because they can't really pick on, you know, the, the real hard science that's being practiced. And two, Michael Schellenberger, you got to consider the source. This guy has for over a decade been, I don't know, you wonder whether he is on the payroll of the American Enterprise Institute or the Koch brothers. He's more of a growth booster than he is a scientist or uh, or even an economist to be taken seriously. I mean, he really is, he's a lot like Bjorn Lomborg. Totally. And, uh, and so it's just a good thing that there are people like Dave and Erica out here spreading the truth instead of uh, that kind of disinformation. He also didn't offer any other alternatives, which if you're going to pick on something, well, what else? Did you create something? (laughs) Like, what else do you have? (laughs) He thinks technology will save us. Well, good luck with that. How's that working out for you so far, Mr. Schellenberger? Gross. (laughs) I don't think we're even going to put a link to that in the show notes because it's just poppycock. So a couple other emails I want to share, and these are, I will share a few about our Overshoot playlist, the top 10 environmental songs, which is like three episodes ago on the Growth Busters podcast. And on, and we'll put links again in the show notes to that podcast. And we'll give you two links because there's one, the kind of the standard podcast that you would hear on most of the podcast apps where you won't hear the full song. Uh, so we did a special one on Mixcloud yeah. where we were able to include the full song. So we'll include links to both of those. We got an email from Jean who wrote, not a big music listener, but enjoyed the podcast. I agree with your number one choice. Thank you, Jean. So that was good to get that validation. (laughs) Evan in California sent me a list of 11 songs that I'd never heard of. These were songs by Metallica, Devo, Leonard Cohen, and others. And that says more about me, you know, not being completely plugged into the music scene than it says about Evan or his musical taste. But Erica, I don't know if you've had a chance. I know I haven't had a chance to go listen to all of those songs, but I intend to. Uh, same here. I have not actually listened, but I, did, I should say I, I've come across more. I should be adding more 
Tom York songs. Everybody knows here that I'm a big Tom York fan. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's something we should do. Yeah, yeah. And Leon emailed a couple of song ideas by the Eagles and John Anderson and... Patrick emailed, I love your work and the concept for this episode is brilliant. Of course, thank you. Um, <laughs> however, you missed my second favorite. Big Yellow Taxi is my favorite, and she had an influence in the artist's development. Before the Deluge by Jackson Brown. And I'm sure I had heard that song, but I had long forgotten it. And so that made me go back and listen to that and look at the lyrics. And that's a pretty intense song. Patrick finishes with a thanks for the, for the good work. And then Howard emailed, Cool environmental song list. A number of my favorite artists on it. Surprised not to see perhaps the most popular environmental song ever, Earth Song by Michael Jackson. And I think we, um, well, I know we've been re kind of responding to these emails and comments as we get them. And you've been adding most of them, Erica, to the Growth Busters playlist Spotify. over on Spotify, right? Yep, yep. So if anybody wants to kind of keep up with uh, all of the songs that have been suggested and a few more that uh, Erica discovers, uh, that's a good place to go look. Yeah, and actually in response to that, I do recall adding Earth Song by Michael Jackson to the playlist. So that, that's up there. Oh, I'm sure you did. Yeah. Oh, Howard also included a link to a YouTube video by a rapper with a conscience named Lil Dicky. Had you heard of Lil Dicky before? I can't say I have. <laughs> huh, okay. Perhaps I'm not as young well, as... Well, anyway, me. there's a lot of famous... <laughs> a lot of celebrities uh, have voices in this video, and uh, it's a pretty interesting video. So we'll include a link to that YouTube video in the show notes. Pretty interesting song and animation there. And then Judith from Colorado wrote, Thanks, Dave. Missed a favorite of mine, Poi Dog Pondering by the Ancient Egyptians. Hmm. Okay, Erica, does that mean anything to you? Had you ever heard of the Ancient Egyptians or Poi Dog Pondering? Uh, news to you? News to me, yeah. Oh. Okay. Anyway. Learn something new every day. <laughs> Interesting stuff. Thanks for suggesting that. Yeah. And so uh, check that Spotify playlist, the Growth Busters playlist. But I tell you, we've gotten enough suggestions that I think, Erica, I think we ought to plan on doing probably two more music episodes, maybe before the year comes to a close. I think we could definitely do follow ups and add some of these songs. Same. I actually made some new musician friends who I talked a little bit about our podcast with, and they are very interested in writing new music uh, that speaks to our environmental crisis right now. So we might have some indie tunes to add to that list. Yeah. And speaking of which, I don't give him a shout out often enough, but uh, we mentioned him in the at the end of that uh, podcast about the Overshoot playlist. And that was the great musician and composer and recording mixing engineer, Jake Fader, who did the Growth Busters theme song that we use to open this podcast and close this podcast every episode. Big shout out to Jake for doing great music specifically for, to Growth Bust by. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, I'm excited to add to our list. I'm excited to have a follow-up episode for all of our songs. Yeah, so we appreciate the comments. And um, people have been frustrated because the website's still broken. You can't make a comment on the post at the growthbusters.org website. And I apologize for that. It hasn't worked its way to the top of our to-do list, sadly. Too much to do. We've got a planet to save. We're busy saving the planet day in and day out. So are you ready for the main event, Erica? We are ready. This is the way the world ends. How droughts and die-offs, heat waves and hurricanes are converging on America. That's the book written by Jeff Nesbitt, who uh, was a senior public affairs official in the U.S. Senate and several federal agencies, such as the Food and Drug Administration. He was a national journalist with Knight Ritter and others. Uh, head of a strategic communications consulting firm for more than a decade. He was director of communications for former Vice President Dan Quayle at the White House and the director of legislative and public affairs at the National Science Foundation from 2006 to th 2011. So the guy gets around, Jeff Nesbitt. He's currently the executive director of Climate Nexus, 
which is uh, an organization that was founded in 2011. And Climate Nexus works to change the conversation on climate change and clean energy from an argument to a constructive search for solutions. They work to correct misinformation about climate change, to encourage an educated and robust debate about threats and responses. I just want you to know this guy's got some bona fides. You know, Jeff Nesbitt has been around the block a few times, wrote this book with a provocative title, and I thought it was worth having a conversation with him. So actually, I interviewed him back in February of 2019, which, Erica, was before you uh, saw the light or before I saw the light and brought you in as Mm co-host of the Growth Busters podcast. So you didn't get to participate in the interview. But why don't we give it a listen? And then, Erica, you and I, I'm really anxious to get your response to what Jeff has to say at the other end. Sounds great. Let's listen. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining us on the Growth Busters podcast. Thanks for having me. Oh, very glad to have you. What uh, prompted you to write this book? What, what did you hope to accomplish? So I've been wrestling with the climate change issue for more than a decade now. First, when I was at the National Science Foundation and now with the organization that I run called Climate Nexus. And it, what's become apparent over the last few years is that the issue itself is perceived by the American public and um, even the media that, that, that has covered it closely as a future threat, that somehow the worst impacts of climate change are going to be felt well off into the distance, maybe at the end of the century. So what that means is that people have assumed that they really might not have to worry about the issue right now. And that is a pretty serious problem for two reasons. First, there are really horrific things happening right now that are either partially or mostly caused by climate change in other parts of the world. And that's the guts of the book. But second, it's important for people to understand that because there are things happening now and because actions to deal with this issue have to occur now or over the next 10 years, this is not something that you can just wait and see how bad it's going to get. We actually can't afford to do that. So that's why I wrote the book. It has quite a few solutions at the end, but I, I, it was important for people in the media to understand this is a serious problem right now. It's not a future threat. It's a present threat. Well, you really hit the nail on the head with that. And I got to say, mission accomplished in terms of uh, putting something out there that really does drive home the point that it is going on right now. And I was so blown away by this catalog that you put together of evidence and impacts. And I was just wondering, did you do this because there's really nowhere else that it's all cataloged so neatly for people? Well, thanks for asking that question. Yes, actually, that's why I did this, because I've been wrestling with this issue for so long and that there wasn't a place where you could go in one book and find out, okay, what's happening in China? What's happening in sub-Saharan Africa? What's happening in Yemen in the Middle East, what's happening with food scarcity issues, what's happening with water scarcity issues, what's happening with extreme weather events. It wasn't all in one place. So I said, ah, I'll just take on this task. So I (laughs) spent the time. I I knew most of the subject matter pretty well already, but I even surprised myself on a couple of instances. I'll give you a good example. I asked the question, is the monsoon season changing? And potentially, is it about to flip? And what I mean by flip is it could have become unstable. The conventional wisdom among scientists has been that the monsoon is stable. It hasn't changed much in 100 years. As I dug into the research, sadly, that's maybe not the case. The monsoon seasons are starting earlier and they're they're ending later. They're unpredictable and we've had lots of dry monsoons compared to wet monsoons in the last generation, like on a three or four to one ratio. And those indications are that it may be on the cusp of flipping. If that happens, that is really bad news. More than a billion people rely on the monsoons almost solely for their fresh water. That's a pretty scary chapter, honestly. And people in India and elsewhere, um, they should be thinking really, really seriously about that. So the answer to the question is yes. I decided let's just put all these stories in one place so that we collectively have them. We understand the threats happening um, now, not at the end of the century. And let's figure out collectively what we need to do about this. Well, now, I don't want to give anyone an excuse not to read the book, but I still want to give people a little bit of a taste of all of the things that that you've cataloged. It's an unfair question, but is there a way Hmm. for you in, you know, in 10 words or less? (laughs) Just kidding. Um, (laughs) Is there a way for you to kind of just quickly run down what you think are the highlights in Cliff Notes fashion? 
Sure. Let's start with Yemen. Most people have heard about the terrorism that emerges from Yemen. It's one of the countries that was listed as a terrorist threat. Mm -hmm. There's a civil war there. Tens of thousands of civilians are either dying or in trouble in Yemen. What people don't understand, and I hope they read the book and read that chapter specifically, is that it's the first water war in the world. Um, Yemen ran out of water about five years ago. Everyone knew it. The scientists knew it. The politicians knew it. But they didn't plan to do anything about it. And it was almost, you know, mostly caused by climate change. It's part of the world where climate impacts are occurring. Everybody knew the civil war was coming. They knew civil unrest was coming because without water, there is no hope. And yet they didn't prepare for it. They didn't recognize the threat. And then sure enough, the, the government collapsed because of lack of natural resources. The same sort of thing happened in Syria, where the farms experienced extreme droughts. Um, people left their farms en masse, went to the cities, there were no jobs, and they joined the, you know, the civil unrest movement. You go to the sub-Saharan region, all 13 countries across the northern Africa, in the Sahel region where the Sahara Desert um, is expanding, it's driving a massive migration problem. Most people think of the migrants who are coming, who are trying to escape are going because they're avoiding terrorists and military conflict. That's true. But long before those occurred, you had droughts and lack of natural resources that basically forced people off their farms. You go into China, you go in, uh, where northern China's uh, effectively running out of water. It's driving their need to go buy every soybean on the planet. Within probably 10 years from now, China may be purchasing every soybean grown on, on planet Earth in order to deal with the water scarcity issues. So appropriate that we hear sirens in the background as you tell us this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why this trade war, I mean, and then, you know, I'll just close with this. That leads then to both political implications, military implications, human uh, rights implications, you know, terrorism implications, all of these, the threat of a lack of natural resources drives unrest everywhere. We're at a point now on the planet where more than half the population in countries, they can't get access to food that's grown inside the country. They can't grow enough food inside the country. And North Korea is an extreme example. Less than 20% of the land there is arable, which means, you know, 80% of the land has been denuded. You can't even grow anything on it. So all of their food has to come from outside of the country. When you have that sort of a situation, that means the population is at risk. If anything happens politically or militarily, people starve. It's that simple. So that's why military planners have said for years, climate change is a threat multiplier. And what they mean by that is that it can make a bad situation much, much, much worse, like happened in, in Yemen, like happened in Syria, like happens in North Korea when they run out of food, like happens in China when they don't have enough food to grow for a very large population. In a nutshell, that's, that's a longer version of the clip notes, but that's that's basically what I walked through in the book. Well, you did a good job of that, and I thought that was such an unfair <laughs> question. So thanks, thanks for taking <laughs> sure. that on. So it seems to me that there's, you know, I'm pretty in tune and paying attention more than most people because of what I do, and yet I don't feel like I've been given this information by governments, by the United Nations, by the news media, or, or by scientists in general. Mm. What's the breakdown here? Why did you have to do this? Well, I think the simple answer is this. I'm not a scientist. I have been a government official. I've had some really big government jobs at the National Science Foundation and at the White House. And, but I'm not a scientist, so I'm a storyteller. So it's a lot easier for somebody like me to sort of boil all these big things down into stories. And that's what I do in this book. I tell, you know, a whole variety of stories. So it's easier for someone. I've been a national journalist. I've, I'm a storyteller. So um, the stories that you're talking about, they're in these reports. The UN IPCC body just issued a 1,600-page report called the 1.5 report. Yeah. So some of the, these things are in that report. The National Climate Assessment just came out. It's, it's a 1,000-page report. It's in there. Um, but it's a big, complicated picture, and it's hard to break that down into stories. So what I've tried to do in this book is tell stories so that people understand, you know, why did the civil unrest happen in Yemen? Why does it matter that Saudi Arabia has run out of water and they had to buy 15 square miles of land in Arizona to grow alfalfa? So I've just I've tried to sort of boil these very big, complicated reports and problems and geopolitical considerations into stories so that people can understand what's happening. So, Jeff, do you think that's uh, 
going to be sufficient. Uh, you're, you've found a, a palatable way to provide this information, these facts to the people uh, so that a layperson can understand. Is that all that was missing? Are, are you expecting now that we're going to see everybody spring into action? <laughs> 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 oh, I wish that were the case. If only it were that simple. Yeah. Um, I think it will help. I think books like this and stories like these help. You're starting to see the tide turn even in the United States. About 75 to 80 percent of the people in the country are finally starting to get it. They're finally starting to understand, my gosh, we, we have a problem on our hands. Storms are bigger, faster. There's more rainfall. Droughts are lasting longer. Agriculture seasons are changing. Species are migrating um, in unusual patterns. All those things are collective. Those, the weight of those stories is starting to change the American psyche. That's a good thing. That means they're getting it. And once about 75% of the public gets an issue, and they sort of really do understand it, and absent a political roadblock, they'll start to, to make actions. Now, that political roadblock is the, is the problem that we have in this country right now. And it's not what you'd think. Um, most people assume that the Republican Party, which is either you know their leaders have denied the issue or even claimed that it's a hoax, mm -hmm. that's actually not true among most Republican voters. Independent voters, Republican voters, especially younger voters under the age of 35, they know this is happening. They want to do something about it. They just their voices aren't loud enough yet to, to tell the Republican leaders in Washington, please do something. That's happening sooner than people believe, which is why I think I'm I'm pretty confident that the weight of the stories, my book and others that people have written and and stories, the weight of that sort of evidence and those stories will mean I'm fairly confident we're going to see significant national climate and energy legislation in two to three years that show the United States doing something about this. And when they do, um, it will put pressure on China and India specifically to act as well, which is you know a significant part of the problem. So yes, I think collectively the stories will have an impact. It needs to add up and then move um, leadership um, at the national level in the United States. Okay, so a, a small part of the book you devote to what you call the, the blueprint and talk a little bit about mm -hmm. what you think the solution is. So you want to share just a little bit about what you think is the key there? Sure. So to make it as simple as possible, a couple of big things need to happen. One is there needs to be what's called a, a carbon price signal to the marketplace. Right now, carbon is essentially – whether you think of it as pollution or just a byproduct of the manufacturing and engineering and industrial process, it's causing harm on the earth. It goes up, it sits in the atmosphere for a very long time, and it's warming our planet, warming the oceans, and causing real trouble um, in, in the ecosystem. There isn't a cost for that. Nobody's pricing that. Other forms of pollution and harm on earth are, are priced, which then changes the energy economy. So first, we need a significant carbon price. And thankfully, people are starting to wake, the, wake up to that. Nearly every economist on the planet now says we need a significant carbon price to change the energy economy equation. And the second big thing besides that, because that will change the energy economy, we need to deal with the, the energy and, and climate infrastructure that's on Earth. So in the electricity sector, we need to get to renewable energy or clean energy electricity as fast as we possibly can, just as, you know, as fast as everybody can make moves in the utility sector, in the, the home electric sector, move as fast as we can. Then in the transportation sector, the same thing needs to occur. And I think the car companies even know this. Um, we need to move as fast as we can away from an internal combustion engine toward electric vehicles as fast as we can. In the manufacturing sector, we need to find much more um, efficient carbon efficient ways to manufacture things like steel and cement. And in the other parts of the transportation sector, we need to find much more fuel efficient ways. Airlines are a good example. They would love to not have to burn so much jet fuel when they fly. And so they're racing the clock trying to figure out how to maybe even create an, elect an all electric um, airplane. And then finally, in the agriculture sector, because so much of the climate problem is related to uh, you know use of land, either either cutting down forests or not allowing forests to grow, or 
growing you know so much cattle and livestock for food that takes up massive amounts of land we need a much more sustainable agricultural process we're going to need it anyway as the population grows so the blueprint walks through how we actually do this and here's the good news we can do this and we've seen rapid growth like that in other industry sectors you know google incorporated in 1995 amazon bought a company called jungly just 30 days later so Google and Amazon were effectively born within 30 uh, days of each other in 1995. 20 years later, they're the two or three largest companies in the world, and a brand new industry has grown up. We need the same thing to happen in renewable energy and renewable transportation. And I, I believe we can see that. It just requires business will, political will, and public will. Now, you don't mention flying less or driving less or uh, anything about stabilizing or contracting the global economy or the global population. You don't think though any of those are part of the equation, huh? Well, they're, they're part of the public will equation. This is an interesting question because when you start putting the pressure on individual people to change their lifestyle – the lifestyle choices of individual people aren't really the problem. The problem is that big industries and companies who market those products and sell those products, they're unwilling to change. So when lifestyle choices can put pressure on those companies and put pressure on those governments to change their research policies, then that works. But even if everybody in the world, you know, made radical choices, which isn't going to happen, it still may not have the impact that we need it to have. So those individual lifestyle choices, um, if they're paired with consumer choices and political choices, because every person on earth has two votes, they can vote as a consumer, they can vote as a, in, uh, politically, their individual actions need to weigh in on those two big ticket items, because that's what, that's what will really change the system. So if you make you know, lifestyle choices that build public will and add to consumer choices, then yes. But just to do it for the sacrifice so that you want to be part of the cause, I, I, this is somewhat controversial when I say this, but I, that's, you know, don't blame the individual, and that's really not necessarily going to solve our, the equation. Well, I welcome your perspective on that because it's definitely a subject that we tease out frequently in the Growth Busters podcast. Yeah. Um, but what about uh, public policy about pursuing uh, economic growth? You don't think we have to uh, get over our obsession with economic growth? Well, the, the, I'll tell you the good news is that this you saw the split between reduced carbon emissions on a national level – while GDPs continued to grow, that separation occurred about three years ago for the first time. And what that proved was that you could have economic growth even as you're trying to restrict carbon emissions, which economists have been saying was certainly possible. We now see that. So, you know, the, the, the energy poverty um, policy discussion, which, you know, people who want to maintain the status quo always hold up to say, you know, it, it's unfair to hold back countries like India and China yeah. um, that want to have the same things that the United States has. I would argue you can have both. You can have economic growth. In fact, you can have explosive economic growth in a brand new industry like renewables or jobs in the renewable sector or jobs in the fuel efficient sector or jobs in the energy efficient sector, and maybe even a lot more jobs if you think that way. And I think most economists would, would now argue you can have economic growth and you can tackle the climate and carbon problem. They aren't as entangled as people thought. What's your take? Uh, we're recording this just shortly after the COP24 climate meeting in Poland. What's your take mm -hmm. on what transpired in Poland? So the really good, there are a couple of really good things happened uh, at the end of the day. Well, actually, three very good things happened at the end of the day in Poland. First, they, they came up with what's called a rule book, which means – Everybody has to play by the same set of rules. That's the easiest way to think about that. That was agreed to. That was important. It was technical in nature, but that's important. It means every country is playing by the same set of rules. The second thing they did was they agreed to transparency. That means the actions that China takes or the United States takes or Brazil takes or India takes is transparent. We can see what they've done and we can measure it. That's really important because that, that's the only way we can know if progress is being made. And then the third thing they did, which was nice, was that they, after a big fight that Saudi Arabia, the United States, and Turkey fought, they, they, they welcomed 
this IPCC 1.5 report that lays out some of these uh, quite devastating impacts and tells us how fast we need to act in order to keep the worst impacts from happening, they agreed to that and they accepted that as part of the deliberations. Those are th- three pretty big things. Did they increase their ambition? In, um, no, but they left that till next year. And did they agree to what you know financing for you know to help countries? like the Marshall Islands or the Maldives or others that are in serious trouble right now because of climate change. No, they haven't solved that either. So, um, but the really big ticket items that they needed to accomplish in Poland, they accomplished. And what about the uh, Trump administration's climate report that came out right before Thanksgiving? Any thoughts about that? <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> if the, if the, and my organization was was pretty heavily involved in that. Half of our staff worked on Thanksgiving in order to get ready for that report. Oh, wow. um, the Trump White House got way too cute by half. They thought that but they could like bury it on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, and boy, did it blow up in their face. I mean, that the report was on the front page of 140 daily newspapers in the United States. Uh, it led the New York Times for 48 straight hours. It was on all the major broadcast networks. It was on all of the Sunday talk shows. And then the news cycle lasted for another week. So it actually completely backfired in their face. That's the political. But the the really good news about the National Climate Assessment is that it may have effectively ended what was left of the climate science debate in the United States because it, it was so clear. The reporting on it was so clear on top of the previous National Climate Assessment Everybody who wants to understand this issue now can. They now know exactly what is happening in the United States. The 20 to 25 percent of the people who just, for whatever reason, don't want to believe that it's an issue or that it's real or that the impacts are happening now, they're not going to change their minds. Um, The National Climate Assessment that was just issued is that foundational document that everybody will use now going forward, including government leaders at all levels in the United States, because it lays it out pretty clearly all across the country. So that's a good thing. So we can take that and now move to, you know, the discussion over how to solve this problem or how to adapt to it or how to respond to it. So that's really a surprising amount of good news about the bad news. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So lastly, Jeff, I want to give you a chance to, Tell us a little bit about Climate Nexus. So we we were started in the shadow of some pretty serious failures in 2009, 10, and 11. There, you know, the international negotiations around climate collapsed in Copenhagen. The cap and trade bill died in Congress, and Climate Gate erupted and cast a long shadow over climate science. So I was at the National Science Foundation and decided to leave and just start a nonprofit that focused on you know helping the media and the public understand what was going on. So that's what we do. We're funded by foundations and we work with the media and we work with stakeholders and, and nonprofit organizations. At big moments like the IPCC reports and the National Climate Assessment and the Paris Climate Agreement, um, but also small reports about science advances and, and economic advances. So it's a sort of a small dedicated team that knows what it's doing and works to you know, change the conversation around the issue in the United States. Doesn't look like that small a team. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's gotten bigger over the years. <laughs> well, that's good. The good. Yeah, the good news is there's a lot of folks who really want to engage on this issue. They want to make a difference, and they want, you know, so that's good. That's great. So I'll put a link in the show notes, and you do have uh, people can subscribe to uh, be kept abreast of what you're up to and what you want the public to know. Um, sure. Yeah, they can sign up for hot news. Uh, we have a daily newsletter first thing in the morning. It's actually really widely read now. I mean, you know, a lot of journalists subscribe to it. It's sort of the roadmap of the issue. And if you're really into the issue and you really want to sort of know what's happening, you can just subscribe to it, and it's, it'll it'll give it to you all in one place. There you go. Anything I haven't given you a chance to pontificate on that you would like to say? <laughs> no, no. Thanks. These are great questions. Well, thanks for writing the book. Thanks for putting a title on it that's (laughs) (laughs) attention-getting. I should have asked you about that. Yeah, not with a bang but a whimper. Did you get a lot of pushback on that title? Did people try to talk you out of it? or? Well, actually, the title was suggested by my publisher, uh, Thomas Dunn, who's sort of a lion in publishing. And uh, I, it's, I think it's a great title. There was a lot of discussion about it. But the truth is, it, it does grab you. It's like, oh, well, what is that all about? Well, it's not actually a book about the world ending, at least not yet. And it also 
opens up to the question. The truth is the world, the planet's going to be fine. It's still going to be here. We might not be. Human beings might not be. Species might not be. That's actually the point. So that sort of a title lends itself to an interesting discussion. Well, thanks for writing it. Thanks for the work you're doing at Climate Nexus. And thanks a lot for this conversation. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, so there you go. What's your response, Erica? What do you think? I think what I find interesting is how Nesbitt speaks about all the environmental turmoil from Yemen to Saudi Arabia to some of the Asian countries like Korea and northern China, and all of which are experiencing extreme droughts and how people are migrating out of their homelands because of this. I would have hoped he would have had something to say about human population numbers or the problem with mass consumption, but he doesn't bring up any of these things at all. Um, Dave, you were the one to bring them up, which I'm glad you did, but that was kind of surprising. I think Jeff had some interesting things to say, but I wouldn't say that I see eye to eye with him, and I chose in the interview not to challenge him or engage him in a debate. I just wanted to give him a chance to put his perspective out there. And so now behind his back, we can kind of talk about <laughs> about what we disagree with. Right. Yeah. But as you heard at the beginning of the interview, I mean, I really kind of sang his praises about the, about this book and, and uh, thanked him profusely for writing the book. I think it's a valuable book. Yeah. And coming from a very reputable source, um, he offers a ton of really great solutions like needing a carbon price to change the energy economy equation um, and needing to switch to renewable energy and renewable transportation as soon as possible. Like creating an all electric plane would be great. So these are all great, but this, of course, would be one way of addressing the climate crisis. It would also create more jobs. But I think, Dave, like you have a bone to pick, as do I. (laughs) <laughs> and that he doesn't seem that reducing consumption, flying or driving less, or contracting the global population is part of the equation, which we obviously do. Yeah, I guess that's true. He tends to fall a little more into the technology solution trap. I'll call it a trap. And, uh, you know, I don't want to poo-poo the technology too much because I really think we do need to, we're going to need that part. We're going to need to sure. work on that part of the sustainability equation for sure. Yeah. Sure. But anybody who just focuses on that and doesn't think that there is other work to be done, man, they're going to be shocked if by some chance the human race figures out a way to really grow to about 11 billion by the end of this century, which is what... Uh, seems to be the main expectation out there led by the United Nations and their most recent world population prospects. If we manage to find a way to do that, there's not going to (laughs) be enough technological magic to keep us from finishing off poor Mother Nature and planet Earth. Yeah, there's kind of a sweet spot between too much technology and not enough. I mean, we, we very much need to keep growing and, well, not growing, but we very much need some technological innovations and advancements. I mean, that that's why we're here. That's why uh, we continue to grow. But with that being the only thing that you have to support the planet and that being the only thing that you put all your faith in, I, I just don't see how that's going to work in the long term. Sooner or later, planet's going to give. <laughs> and you brought up the fact that he kind of discounted individual action. He did sort of allow that if individual choices end up putting pressure on the companies and the governments to change, that then individual actions can be important in that respect. But otherwise, he kind of dismissed individual action. And, you know, we've had a, a few guests and I run into people almost every week who really do, I think, discount the value of individual action. They say we need to change government policy. We need to change the system. It's impossible for individuals to really make a difference in this this growth-obsessed system. And I don't want to stop trying to change the system. I don't want to stop trying to put pressure on policymakers to do the right thing. But I think all of these people are underestimating the value of individual changes in a, in a couple of respects. And one key one I wanted to mention to you, see what you think, Erica, is that imagine what if Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, what if he had grown up in a household that had a really strong conservation ethic? What if he had been raised to conserve energy, to conserve water, to keep his footprint small? 
now that he's in a position of power, it wouldn't seem so strange to him. It wouldn't be so uncomfortable. He'd be ready to bring the, the nation along. And I pick on Mitch because he deserves to be picked on. But, you know, there are over 400 other people in Washington, D.C. who have some power, who most of whom were not steeped in a conservation ethic as they grew up. And that works against us. And so if we're not busy changing the way we live today, every one of us, every family, especially the families that are raising children, then their kids are going to grow up to be part of the problem right. instead of part of the solution. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're all influencing each other every single day. I don't think it's just one or the other putting all of the responsibility on the corporations, but it, it's our responsibility. I mean, it, we we could be the ones to influence the corporations and it could go the other way as well. But yeah, it's it's not one or the other. It's both. Yeah. Um, and I think that does start with the individual. Yeah, there's a reason those corporations spend millions and millions of dollars on advertising to sway us. You know, if they don't sway us, then their revenue is in the tank. But the biggest bone I have to pick with Jeff Nesbitt from that interview really was the fact that he thinks that you can have economic growth, even robust growth in the right industries and still tackle carbon emissions. That was a real problem for me. Did that ring any alarm bells for you? Yes. I think what really stuck was his words that he, <laughs> he said that we have proven that you can have economic growth even as you try to reduce carbon emissions. And so I, I had a problem with proving because nothing's ever really proven. That was one time. That is one example three years ago. But the world three years ago isn't the world today. So I, I think that's kind of a dangerous mindset to have. Uh, things are getting worse, not better. So I believe that he's wrong in saying that carbon and economic growth are not as entangled as people think. I think they absolutely are. It goes hand in hand. Yeah. But he's in good company, wouldn't you say? There are a lot of people out there who really believe that we can just convert uh, our uh, power system over to solar and wind and just keep on chasing growth and have a happy ending. All right. And he also says it's unfair to hold back India and other countries who want the same thing the U.S. has. But people like Mathis Walker Nuggle and other really reputable scientists out there say that that's just not sustainable. If everybody lived like us, it's just not sustainable. That should not be the goal. I mean, I, I certainly don't want this. <laughs> I do my best to consume as little as possible, and it shouldn't be the goal. Right. You're not saying that we should just continue to. Uh overconsume here in the overdeveloped world and while telling the people in the global south, sorry, we beat you to it and there's not enough planet for you, so you can't do it. Nanny, nanny, poo poo. <laughs> no, no, we should be setting the example yeah. for how to live sustainable lives. We have definitely got to streamline. We've got to skinny up our lives to make room for the poorest billion people in the world really deserve to be able to live better lives, even if that increases the size of their footprint. And it probably will. Yeah. We have a lot to live. <laughs> we have a lot to give. Yeah. Uh, Sounds like a Pepsi. Remember that Pepsi jingle? <laughs> you probably don't. You've got a lot to live and Pepsi's got a lot to give. You weren't even a twinkle in your parents' eye when that jingle was playing on the airwaves of uh, the three and only three uh, television networks in the United States back in the day. <laughs> uh -huh. Anything else you want to pick on Jeff Nesbitt about while he's not in the room to defend himself? Yeah. I mean, you asked him about the Trump administration's climate report that effectively ended the debate, which is good. I think that's a good thing. I agree with that. But You know, I was thrilled to, uh, and I hope he's right, I thought it was noteworthy at least, that he thinks that even Republican voters largely get climate change and want it addressed. It's just that their voices haven't been loud enough yet for Republican leaders in Washington to notice. I haven't really witnessed that myself. I don't think I've observed that, but I really hope he's right about that. Do you think you're seeing that, Erica? Not at all. Uh, and then the other kind of nice thing was that he thinks we're at a point where within a couple of years we'll see the U.S. take action. And I tend to think that's probably true. It seems to me like the, uh, the pace of improvement in the whole public conversation has quickened. I think we're moving in the right direction a little more quickly than we were. We'll see. Okay. What else do you have? 
That's it. That's all I have to say about Jeff. Jeff ended by saying the planet is going to be just fine. Humans and species might not be. Uh, That's what the book is about. And that kind of stuck with me because it's very, it's very true. Like in all of our discussions, we, I mean, our goal is to save the planet, the planet that is all of our homes. But whether we're successful at that or not, the planet is going to be just fine. It's us. We're in trouble. And it's amazing to me how that just doesn't resonate with enough people today, that all of the issues that we're seeing, it's not the planet that's in trouble. It's, it's, it's really us. The planet is going to be just fine. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to agree with you 100% on that. I've heard that a lot. And 10 years ago, I might have been a little more inclined to say, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right about that. But Erica, I'm not as sure as I was about that. Not that I was ever that certain. Because it seems to me like the scale of the human enterprise has gotten so big and powerful that today the condition of the planet is more important than you might think. Yes, it'll be just fine, but it'll take millions of years for it to recover from what we're doing to it. It won't be just fine 50,000 years after we're done, unfortunately. And I think it's not fine enough now just to support us. So we need to take care of the planet. We need to save the planet if we want to save human civilization, because we're on the verge of pushing the planet into a a place where it just won't support human civilization. That is a real danger. And then even if we weren't concerned about human civilization, I think we owe it to all the other species on the planet to not mess up their home. Wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm not crazy about saying the planet's going to be just fine. You know, we don't need <laughs> I should, to worry. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think them. you're saying we don't need to worry about the planet. No, yeah. no, no. What I, I guess what I meant to say was, uh, and, and this is how I interpreted it. Maybe Jeff didn't mean to or intend for this to be said. But the way I interpreted that was the earth is going to outlive the human species, whether we fix it or not. It will if we don't do anything. It's going to be in a really bad state. But it's going to outlive the human race if we don't do something about it now. Very true. Yep. Then I wouldn't argue with you about that at all. So the book uh, is called This is the Way the World Ends, How Droughts and Die-Offs, Heat Waves and Hurricanes Are Converging on America. And Jeff, you heard it from his mouth that he's not predicting that the world is going to end. He's pretty optimistic, probably overly optimistic. But I think it's a good book. I want to recommend it because you go to the refrigerator and open the door and there's beer in there. You think everything's okay. Well, read this book and you'll see, wow, everything's not as okay as I thought. And we need to know that. Absolutely. So we'll include a link to the book in the show notes for sure and a link to Climate Nexus too in case you want to get on their email list or check out what they're doing. Thank you to our listeners for providing feedback. And if you have any comments or questions, uh, want to continue this conversation, definitely write to us, myself or Dave. We are always happy to answer. Yep, we love to hear from you. We just can't uh, hear from you in the comments section on the website. So send an email to podcast at growthbusters.org or write a comment at the Growth Busters Facebook page or the Growth Busters podcast Facebook page. I've been posting some interesting stuff on those pages this week. There's a lot of news that we just don't have time to put into this podcast because we know you don't have three hours to listen to this. You've got to go listen to three hours of Joe Rogan, I think. So uh, so be sure and head over to Facebook, uh, like it or not. Uh, we always put interesting stuff there, and I'd really value your comments over there. And in fact, yesterday I offered free small family stickers to the first five people that got the answer right as to whether the new posture of Iran about uh, trying to get the women to birthing more babies, whether that's intelligent or insane. Insane. Uh, so <laughs> we can have some pretty good conversations over there. Yay. Oh, good. So you get a sticker too, Eric. <laughs> Yay. Free sticker. For stickers. If you're curious about these stickers, that's just one of the cool things you'll find at growthbusters.org. Click on store to find the small family stickers. Uh, There are bumper stickers and t-shirts and uh, the purpose of them isn't for us to destroy the world and litter it with swag, but it is to get the word out and start conversations and get people to start thinking about this. And that's really what we're trying to do. So if you think that's important, I really want to highly recommend that you subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already on your podcast app that costs you nothing and recommend it to your friends that costs you nothing friends don't let friends miss the real story on sustainable living and that's what erica and i try to give you each episode yeah so as always we'll see you over at growthbusters.org and at the facebook page Uh, until next time erica thanks for 
your partnership in planet saving. Thank you, Dave. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a robuster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth busters.